Hi, my name is Sean Shaler. This is my friend Chris Ford. He is the Objective Geek. And this week we are going to talk about episodes 7 and 8 of Avatar The Last Airbender. It is a two-part episode called The Winter Solstice. But before we get into that, Chris, how's it going? Uh, doing, doing good. I don't have any. Uh, I don't think I have anything random to say about my day or about since uh, since last time. I am very much in, excited for uh, for next week, but well, you know, we'll get to that later. I'm excited for next week too. Which, let's be honest, that's the only reason that we're doing this <laughs> this <laughs> week. So usually we do two two week breaks, and that's uh, I'll take the blame for that. I, I get pretty busy. I don't want to get burned out. All that blah blah blah. Um, but this week we're like we had this idea for next week. Like, oh, but that's like a week away. We got to do another one this week. And that's why we're here. And it feels like I literally just got done editing the last video because I did like two days ago. So um, that's exciting. So, uh, well, in that case, then we'll jump right into the news and nonsense section. And the only news I really had was that that, that anime series on Netflix that we talked about last week, um, The Dragon Prince, that's... Tonight, Prince, yes. right now, as we're recording, it won't be tonight for anybody watching. Not this. the artist formerly known as the Dragon Prince. The art. <laughs> I saw a <laughs> meme. I don't know why I'm bringing this up. I saw a meme where somebody put a mustache on Rihanna, and they didn't even like caption or anything. You just knew it was supposed to be Prince. Like it was perfect. <laughs> I felt funny. kind of bad for Rihanna, but whatever. There's worse people to be compared to. Um, so yeah, the Dragon Prince. Uh, <laughs> Probably right now we could go watch it. We could also be watching football. We could be watching all sorts of things, but instead we're here. Whatever. That's fine. Um, but if you haven't yet, when you watch this episode, you should go see if the <laughs> Dragon Prince would be something you like. And then other news yeah, and nonsense. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was saying I've heard good things about it. I haven't even begun to explore it any more than what we talked about last time. Like we talked about it, and I was like, oh, just, that's a thing. And then now it's gone out of my life for a while. It's football season. Just, it's so hard for me. Yeah. Just being on Twitter, like, things are like, oh, it's a good show. Like, some things were, I think, a little bit hyperbolic. <clears throat> like, both negative and bad. One was like, it's a good show, but it's not Avatar. I'm like, you don't... It's not supposed to be Avatar. It. Yeah, exactly. I'm like... <laughs> I'm going. I can't even really make that comparison with Korra. I have a theory, and this is my um, this is my way of tying in Dragon Quest Eleven because I've put in like thirty hours now, <laughs> and uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like I have a regular job and I do a lot of other stuff <laughs> and I do this and blah blah blah. Um, but I put in like thirty hours. The thing with Dragon Quest is that there's always like ten years in between releases. So then when one actually comes, all of us Dragon Quest nerds are like, it's the best game ever. And then everybody else is like, this game kind of sucks. And then after you, <laughs> if you really step back and don't look at it as a Dragon Quest guy, you're like, yeah, it's not a great game. But it's a pretty good game, not a great game. And I think that the Dragon Prince is the same way. It's been a while since we've seen Korra. You hear this name come up, you get excited. And half the world yeah. is just stoked to have anything related to it that... And then the other half mm. of the world's like, whatever, it's not Avatar. Move on. <laughs> no. Grow up. Korra grew up. And then lately, then lately, there's been all these rumors. Well, it hasn't been a lot of rumors, honestly. There's been a few rumors, false rumors, that there'll be a third Avatar animated series. But those rumors are pretty false and have no basis or anything to support them. And I don't think the creators really care to do that. Like They're kind of off doing a lot of their own things. Um Michael D. Martino has a book. I don't know what Brian Konetsko is up to nowadays. I know he's one of them is writing core comic books. I uh, forget which one it is. I could easily look. But but I think, you know, they tell the stories they want to tell, and then they just uh, want to go do some other stuff, so good for them. I totally agree in the sense that I'm not sure they're – I firmly believe in too much of a good thing. Um, I like cir cir uh, stories that come full circle and that have a lot of closure. That's mm -hmm. honestly that's one of the things that honestly keeps me from delving sort of too far into the other lore is I've like I've kinda had my fill <laughs> and I like it where it's at. I still will, but yeah. Uh, I have I saw the some of the conversation on that Facebook group that we're in. I I'm not sure I saw any other <laughs> any other proof or confirmation of any series that just just people yeah. talking who knows where they get their ideas, but Yeah. Not not sure. Not sure. 
I mean, yeah, I would love another show, but also I love the creators and having letting them have a life outside of this, not be completely defined by this show. And I'm sure they feel the same way. Whatever freedom, whatever they want to do, I support them doing that. They've earned it, absolutely. And I just watched that documentary. You sent it what like an hour ago, and it's only a half hour long. So <laughs> yeah. I did watch that. I watched that one. <laughs> Um, I forced myself to watch it before I turned football on, and then I turned football <laughs> on, and then you called. Ah, oh, whatever. Two teams I hate anyway. It's, you know, what? I don't really like that whole division. That's a different topic for a different day. Um, <laughs> it's uh, AFC AFC North. Not a big fan of the division. So, uh, and then the other piece of news. It was on the tip of my tongue. What was it? Oh, you were talking about the documentary. Yeah, so uh, in the documentary, which, by the way, was excellent, I will watch the other thing that you sent, mm-hmm. which I don't even remember what it was. I liked the documentary. Um, what I did enjoy most was seeing that the the heavier set guy that was essentially the inspiration for Toph's fighting style. Yes. That yeah. They described <laughs> him as like looking like a Baptist preacher, and then he comes out and is like one of the greatest <laughs> fighters in the world. So yeah. I said that was news. Sifu Kisu. <laughs> It was yeah. just really fun. Sifu Kisu, who is the uh, the main uh, choreographer, the main martial arts consultant, he was like, because could Brian Kanisko and Michael DiMartino came to him like, yeah, we got this new earthbender, and, uh, but she might be a little different because she's blind. And he was like, all right, I know a guy. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you see this like unassuming guy who's like kind of overweight, got glasses. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> He was like, you don't know, this guy's actually one of the top martial artists in the world. He, and, like, his movements are way different. And, and he is credited um, in in the show with being, like, if you see the credits when they roll and they go through Toph, like, there is a specific, like, Toph martial arts consultant. <laughs> like, it's in, he's credited as that in the credits. And that style was called uh, something to do with, like, uh, Southern Mantis. Praying Mantis Karate. Yeah, because it's all, it's like, it's like, this like a pre mantis does um it's funny i've been watching a lot of power rangers recently and uh one thing I've... <laughs> i'm just gonna let you i'm just gonna let you gloss over that like that's not a thing like yeah well, whatever we all kind of watch power it. rangers okay so the the power rangers 25th anniversary was on and they did like a special and i had to watch it because i remember 25 years ago being blown away by it so i watched it my daughter watched it with me and before this my daughter never watched power rangers and uh so that got her hooked on it so we've been watching so so like tommy the original green ranger who then turned white who then turned red who then came back and was black um he was in that show i was like yeah he's the greatest ranger of all time (laughs) but uh and so we've been watching me and my daughter have been like watching a lot of the old mighty Morphin power rangers and those those actors like they deserve a whole lot of credit because they were actual experts at these fighting styles, at, at these certain things. Like some of them were. So Jason, the Red Ranger, he was a legit martial arts ex- expert. Uh, the Black Ranger, uh, Zach, he was a legit martial arts <laughs> like that. Dan- and also he could dance. Um, the Pink Ranger, she was an actual gymnast. Like she was a legit gymnast. So was Blue Ranger Billy. He was a gymnast. And Tommy Oliver, he was a martial arts in person. And, and I bring up Toph. Right? Uh, no, that's a nah, nah. That's a that Jason. Wait, no. Well, that's a different Red Ranger. It is a Red Ranger, but that's like Wild Force Red Ranger. I think he's a criminal. Got it. Got uh, it. But the original Red Ranger, Jason, he's he's still cool. Uh, but then, so then also the Yellow Ranger, who sadly enough she has passed away since since the show. But her fighting style, which she legit knew, was praying mantis, and I always remember that because there's an episode where she's practicing praying mantis and showing someone how to do it, and then the monster they fight is a literal like mantis. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. But is, yeah, is this still when the monsters were little pieces of clay, and then the one guy had put them in a machine, and then it just spit out these giant yes. vicious? Okay. Yeah, Finster Good. put them in the machine. Finster, Loved thank it. you. So. All right, that's the only Power Rangers that I'm really familiar with would be that. What's the best? Uh, that area. So I say that very uh, biasly. Uh, the <laughs> I will say, so I was never a huge fan of Power Rangers the show. Uh, maybe it just didn't hit the right time slots or whatever for me. But is there any 
better setup for action figures than a power rangers and b all these enemies where you always have a smaller enemy and then you have a bigger enemy <laughs> and then you have the megazord like is there any better setup for action figures no, and toys not. for kids to play with i don't think there mm-hmm. is that's perfect and the thing is people oftentimes call bs on power rangers because it's like well why don't they just jump in their megazords to begin with and get the fight over with zordon specifically says when they're indoctrinating the power rangers like you can never escalate a fight and that's honestly that makes a lot of sense. Like you can't, you can't bring. That's un. That's unfair. Like, you can't bring a knife to a to a fist fight. Like you you are. <laughs> you know the old. You saying. are the bad guy at that point. <laughs> I think there's also an element of uh, responsibility behind it too, right? You don't want extra. Yeah. Destruction or casualties when it's not necessary. Exactly. Not created, it yes. is necessary yeah. in every single episode. But only, <laughs> yeah. only when the bad guy starts it. So there's an important exactly. important life lesson to be learned there. <laughs> I don't know where we were going with all that other than oh the, the praying mantis guy was really cool. And so if you yeah. if you look at that guy, you're like, All right, I could outrun him, probably. Because like even when he's walking, he just he walks like a like an upper middle aged guy with a that's slightly obese. But when he's like his yeah. hand movements, I thought, it's, it looks lethal. I, I couldn't even see it on the TV. It's like I gotta watch this in like sixty pr- frames a second to see if I can get a better picture. It's unreal. So uh, watch that documentary, Chris. Do you know what that documentary is called? Off the top of your head. I don't remember. I know I just watched I it. I mean, I just you can just go to YouTube and Google Avatar Last Airbender documentary and, and it's it will be about 30 the two minutes. creators essentially is what it is and it's a yeah. 30 minute video. Very humble beginnings for the, you know, for what I consider the greatest show of all time. Yes, but I also like that they didn't have it wasn't like a real chip on your shoulder or soppy story kind of feeling like it's just two guys that worked worked really hard and something really cool yeah. came out of it. There was no uh there wasn't yeah, like, it's not much, like they were no, downtrodden no excess drama or anything. Yeah, there's no added <laughs> yeah. drama or anything to this. Like, all right, these two guys came up with a good idea, and they're very clear. Yeah. I just think it's scary. crazy that they somehow built a whole freaking universe, and like, they pretty much had the whole backbone and outline of the whole universe in like three weeks or something like that. I think uh, that's before they went to go uh, pitch it. Okay, so it's, if I remember right. They had about three weeks, and it was about a weekend where they kind of got the the first intuition that turned into anything that we might recognize today. Like, they had started playing around, and then one of them was doing yoga, and something just kind of clicked. And yeah. that's and so basically two weeks for the most part. They had some details worked out. Good stuff, though. Definitely go watch it. It's only 30 minutes, so it was pretty easy watching. But like I said, it was very, it was very mm-hmm. clean cut and straightforward. No, like... No, no added drama or messiness. It just talks about these two guys and how they came up with the idea. Yeah. And um, I don't even know where that, where it originates on. Like I don't know what that documentary was on. I was just on YouTube one day and I found it. Like it's not on any Blu-ray or any DVD anywhere. At least I don't think it is. Uh, but I'm not sure. I do believe I saw a Nickelodeon stamp on it. Now yeah. that could just be like a citation thing, like oh, this property maybe, is owned maybe, by Nickelodeon. Maybe, maybe it was on the special features of the Last Airbender DVD. <laughs> but there's no commentary on there that you imagined. But you, but there's this great talk. No, I mean, I, I meant, I meant, I meant the uh, the actual the M Night Shyamalan movie. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that's no wonder. Yeah, nobody's <laughs> yeah, seen that that's... ever. Ugh. Anyway, I'm saying ugh, yeah, like I've seen it. I still have not. That's going to be a theme every episode. I'm going to come back and be like, Chris, two more weeks. Still haven't seen it. You're welcome. So that's that's all the news I have. We haven't had a big, long two-week break since the last time, uh, like usual. So any other news? Nah. Uh, I did pull up this beautiful picture of your poster here, which you can see, right? You can see what I'm showing on the screen there? Yes, I can see it. So that is uh, that is the poster that you uh, crafted and cut out and painted and then used a glossy glass <laughs> resin finish on it. And I'm sure it has a name. And you got lots of nice feedback on the Facebook group. Yeah. So that was good. There it is. Yeah, that's, that's I, uh, I, it looks great. That's what I'm getting at. It looks fantastic. 
Yeah, it took me a while to come up with the. Like I said, it took me at least thirty hours to just physically do it. It probably took me another five to come up with the comp- composition that I wanted. Um, like I went back and forth on like, do I want the air bending kids or not? You know, because I wanted to kind of move. Initially, I wanted to move Tenzin where. Um, dang it! Why don't I remember who Asami is? Is and I wanted to move Asami down. That way, it all kind of parallels. Um, to the other side um, but then I was like you know what this works better also because I think Rava represents the beginning of the story and the air beating kids who are opposite of her represent the future of the story so I did a lot of I put a lot of thought into <laughs> there's how a I lot of people to go there's a lot of lore and meaning behind your poster very nice yeah anyway great poster looks tremendous <laughs> Someday, I don't want you to do it for me because it seems like a waste of your time, but someday you'll have to show me how you did it, and I'll do one for, like, Dragon Quest or Kegu or something cool like that. I'll go crazy. I'll go a different direction. Yeah. Try to make it my own. <laughs> so, a uh, nice poster. And now, if you have any cleanup from our previous episode. Uh, no, I did listen to it. Uh, it, was pretty, it was fairly clean. I, I thought so <laughs> as well. I will say I like the new microphone a lot better than my old <laughs> microphone. It has made a huge difference. And now, instead of sitting very uncomfortably like on the floor next to my PC, it doesn't look any different here, but I'm in a much more comfortable chair with the microphone right here, and I feel like a normal human rather than like leaning over next to my PC and using a bad <laughs> set of headphones. So new mic made me feel pretty good about it, and I really liked how it sounded. So... Good. No cleanup. It was a boring episode anyway. What would we even bother cleaning up? <laughs> so that brings us to then the synopsis. What a segue. That boring episode. Let me give you a quick recap. They wind up by this small earthbending village and they see this guy earthbending and they're like, hey, let's make a friend. And they chase him. He runs away. He's clearly trying to hide something. And they find out that his little earthbending village is under siege from the Fire Nation and they basically gather up all earthbenders they can and put them on this kind of oil rig looking thing in the middle of the ocean. Long story short, they end up capturing him and then uh, Katara gets herself captured so they can find out where this prison is and then free all of these earthbenders and they're successful and it's dumb but George Takei is there and that's exciting. And so now they are near another, I believe they're still in the Earth Kingdom, I believe it's another earthbending village. Um, it just it doesn't really come up, but I believe it's another earthbending village. And what pulls them out of the sky, what takes them off track, essentially, is they see this big plot of dead land that they describe as looking like a scar. And that's what gets them down, catches their attention. And so that, that brings us to Winter Solstice Part 1, which is called The Spirit World. And the opening scene, then, is Aang's Dilemma. Basically, they land, and he is having a hard time coping mm-hmm. with the fact that it may or may not be his fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Aang, you know, they, they decipher that the fire nation has burnt all of these uh, trees to the ground and Aang gets real frustrated about it. One thing, Sokka gets really frustrated too. And he starts like yelling and stuff. Uh, and Katara sees how like distraught Aang is like Sokka calm down. like, but I can't, I can't be loud. I can't be angry. <laughs> I mean, it almost makes like his anger seem like you don't matter, Saka. But Aang's really taking this hard. So, Saka, shut up! Only um, benders can get mad. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but Aang, <laughs> so, that's like racism right there. Like, listen, only benders have the right oh, to yeah. vote on this on this uh, flying bison right here. <laughs> only benders. Yeah, uh, but Aang is really upset at himself because he feels like he should have been here. He should have done something like, you know, I don't even know how to be an avatar. I don't know. I was airbending and Charles was like, well, you know, going to the North pole to find you a water teacher, water bender teacher. He's like, yeah, that's the water bend, but no one's here to teach me how to be the avatar. And that is a legit concern because Aang has, he has no guidance. He, he, he literally kind of in a way, just learned like three months ago that he was the avatar. I mean, because it's been it's been about three weeks since I think since the Water Tribe 
since they were down in the water in the Southern Water Tribe, and probably two weeks before that that he ran away because you know he was an Avatar and they're taking it from him. So maybe he just learned his Avatar like a legit month or two ago. Yeah. So he has completely no real training in this. It seems like it's been forever. A because we do our episodes two weeks apart, but B that's. <laughs> That's also how kids were watching it. They were watching it one week at a time. Yeah. So at this point, it's already been maybe six weeks in real life of total episodes or something, give or take. <laughs> uh, but to Aang, you know, we could only be talking about a few weeks here. Like, he's not he's not realized. He's still coping with this whole, uh, uh, just the magnitude of being the Avatar. And all. So that's a good point to bring up, is the time mm-hmm. frame is different than it probably feels. And what happens yeah. next? Uh, Oh, and then it does... Oh, I'm, if you had something else to add. No, go, go ahead. Well, it cuts away to to Iroh in the bathtub. Or not in a bathtub. In a in like a hot spring, basically. And he's just soaking there. Another reason I wanted to bring this up as a scene... Because it does cut away. This is one of those sort of two storyline episodes. And then yep. you get this beautiful picture here of... Um, <laughs> Suko's getting real mad at him. He's like... Uh, Uncle Iroh, come on, we gotta leave now. And then he stands up. Is like, All right. <laughs> second thought, take a few minutes. Yeah, the thing is, Uncle Iroh probably did that on purpose, knowing that Zuko would leave him alone, and he can get some more relaxing time. Also, how did this? This is a weird thing to put in a kids show. It's, like, I get it. I mean, I don't know. Just it's just toilet humor, kind of. I mean, and just like bathroom yeah. humor, sort of. It, I yeah, I think I, I watched the episode today with my daughter, and I think she laughed at this, at this part. She's like, ah, ha, ha, why is he naked? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> okay. In my head, because your daughter's so, a small yeah. child, and small children hate baths. <laughs> she was probably, I thought she would just be laughing, like, ha, he has to take a bath. <laughs> yeah. Laughing at other people's misery. <laughs> so, uh, But yeah, on, on this side of the story, um, it's a little more comedic, I think, than, uh, than Zuko's so. stories usually are, or a little bit more... I wouldn't say lighthearted, but not as a, a serious. But it, while but Aang it is, is dealing with a much more serious uh, story, it is. It's definitely flip flopped here. I would I would go as far as to call it lighthearted, especially even at the end when Suko and Iroh yes. face some conflict, and we'll get there. There's still more of a touching aspect than we mm-hmm. really get out of Suko and Iroh, or that than we've got at this point. So it is lighthearted. Yeah. That's really all there is to say about this particular scene, but it cuts back and forth a few times. <laughs> so the real next scene is that when they go into this town and these villagers describe that they're being essentially harassed by a, a monster from the spirit world every single night recently. Yeah, so it's another... So um, this old man comes up to him and he's like, I've heard the st- stories. Like, are you really the Avatar? He's like, yes, I am. Which then kind of reiterates that it's not it's not uh, completely out there that the avatar is back like he is slowly building up his uh building up his his uh ah, dang well, i can't think it's support <laughs> Build, building up his uh he's leveling dang, up really, you know, he's leveling, yeah, up, he's his leveling avatar. up i guess <laughs> his notoriety is building his his uh fame is also building or at least yeah notoriety i think was where i was looking for um, Sounds right. And so you know they want him. These people recognize him, him right away. That doesn't. It's, I don't yeah, think that's really been happened too. That he just away. like walks up and they're like, "You're the Avatar, right?" I don't think that's really happened yet. Yeah. Right, to this point. Maybe no, I don't has. think it has. Because when they went to Kyoshi, I mean, granted that was like one of the first stops. They're like, "You're not the Avatar," so he had to prove with airbending. Now they just see a kid with airbending tattoos. They're like, "Oh, you're the Avatar." Um, and so they need him to help out because he's really the only person they can help. And because they're like, you know, the spirit has been taking away people. And we don't know why. Um, it's another it's another thing to reinforce that Aang is the bridge between the human world and the spirit world. And it also is another reminder that he has no idea what the heck he is doing. <laughs> Especially when it comes to actual avatar stuff. When it comes to that part of the job of being the bridge. Now back to um, Max tracking just a step is when they went to Omashu. Boomi knew who he was right away. But even after he had lost the disguise, those people still didn't didn't know yeah. him. I had to second guess myself there. But only Boomy, and even Boomy didn't know right away. He had to throw the chicken at him first, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say out loud. But I'm glad I got to <laughs> throw the chicken at him. <laughs> happens That's all like... the time. Happens all the time. Yeah. No, 
No, they had to, you know, in order to prove that they're an avatar, like either they have a connection to, uh, <laughs> they have to have a connection to past toys or artifacts with the avatar. Nope. Boomy's test is throwing chicken at him. Some chicken. Like, I can just imagine if Boomy somehow outlived <laughs> Aang, that he just walks up to Korra, throws a piece of chicken. Like, it's her. It's, <laughs> that's the avatar. Now I can die. What's better yet is if she like wasn't paying attention and it just hit her in the face and he's like, eh, she's not the avatar. <laughs> Sorry, that's just she's my, not, that's, that's my that's own a, disdain. That's a missed opportunity. Yeah, that's my own disdain coming out. I, I will say, so it's not relating to this episode, but we watched that YouTube video about uh, the puppets, the Avatar, the Last Airbender puppets or the puppet benders or whatever yeah. it's called. And that clip, the very first clip there would have been good for this scene where Aang's like all in self-doubt and self-wallowing <laughs> and stuff. He's like, I'm the worst Avatar ever of all time. And uh, Sokka's <laughs> just sitting there silent. He's like, what, no complaints? He's like, nah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a, off to, that's a tangent. Next time, next time. So yeah, hey, bye, I spirit monster. They explain that as the solstice gets closer and closer, and I think this is important, is that, that the mm-hmm. the spirit world and the real world get closer and closer where the borders kind of become blurred. And that's how they believe yeah. that the spirit monster is coming over recently. And it's also kind of how Aang learns about the solstice. Yeah. Um, also, I do love the look of Heibai. I love the animation of him. Like, he's sort of this weird, twitchy... Like, he looks unhinged especially when he's moving because it's very just like scattered here over there over there over there like it looks like you know you can't really stop him he's just kind of a real dark spirit who just wants to wreak havoc and steal people now i think it is a, i think it's just a spirit power but there's a part of me that wants to believe that it like because the connection between the two worlds isn't totally hasn't totally disappeared, that he's sort of like glitching in and out in between worlds, and that's like why he's glitching over here and glitching over there. But I decided. Oh, that's interesting. I I, I talked to myself, you know, like the movie Wreck It Ralph, where she's just like it's a yeah, glitch no, type yeah. thing. But um, I kind of talked myself into you know what? it looks controlled. I think that's just one of his spirit powers, and <laughs> my my imagination's just trying to put stuff where it doesn't belong. But yeah, he's a cool looking monster. I don't know if I like his two little random T Rex arms up top, but whatever. They, 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 look, they aid his quest for destruction. They look like they don't do anything. Yeah, and he kind of uses like, them, but they're usually just in like weird poses. They're not actually. Maybe they destroy stuff. I should go back and watch yeah. it. Point is, they're kind of weird little T Rex arms, but he's pretty vicious looking. I'll give him that. And so then he. Oh, I'm sorry. It cuts away first. So nothing bad has happened yet, but it does cut away. And then we see Iroh back in the bath, and he is confronted by some Earthbenders, uh, military Earthbender officials, while he is naked in his bathtub. And, and it's a hot <laughs> spring. I keep saying his tub. It's a hot spring. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I think this is interesting because these are, Iroh and Zuko are clearly the antagonists, but... In, the, in this, especially in this episode, they're not the antagonists in this specific story. Like, you know, the antag- the protagonist doesn't always have to be the good person. Um, so, in my head, there's two protagonists, and, o- and oftentimes when they do that dual story, Zuko and Iroh are the protagonists of their story. And so, even though the Earthbenders are good people, they're fighting on the right side of history. Like, they're not like. Like bad earthbenders, like we're we might pro meet earthbender later on. on this show. Yeah, we're pro yeah. earthbender. Uh, but you're still you're made to root for Iroh and maybe even Zuko. Like my daughter watching this, she was like, "Oh, why are they taking Iroh?" Why? Uh, well, they like, because Iroh is, <laughs> has you know has done terrible things in the past, but you know the way they portray him here is uh, much more sympathetic. Um, that he is more so the protagonist on this side of the story. Two points off that, and first you mentioned when we have these split episodes. I think this important that they're kind of the protagonists, Suko and Iroh, because those are the episodes where we kind of get in touch with them uh, more personally as more than just the bad guys. That's where we find some depth. And second mm-hmm. of all, we, we've all already, everybody that's watched the show up to this point already loves Iroh. Uh, if you don't, then you yeah. probably don't like the show yeah. at all. This is probably the first one where you 
really feel for for Zuko even and it's probably not a ton because he's not doing anything really compassionate you know he starts off by being a jerk and stuff right away but there's enough of the comedy he's kind of on a on a Mm -hmm. a positive mission trying to save his uncle at the end he does something I don't want to spoil just yet spoiler alert later but he does something else that indicates that he's just thinking about Iroh right now Um, and it's it's kind of touching in that way all right so then they cut back here and what else happens? Oh, this is where Sokka gets captured, which is what I had started to say earlier. The Hey Bai, the spirit monster, <laughs> takes Sokka, who's trying to help Aang, takes him back to the spirit world. Uh, yeah, and Aang, yeah, Aang tries to go and get him, but he, uh, and it's kind of a weird thing, because Aang, they, they clap on, but then Sokka just completely disappears, and he gets taken to the spirit world. Um, I think it's interesting because Sokka is the most, or he's the least believe believe in this stuff. Like he's the least religious person, and he's the one being taken to the spirit world. So I feel, I feel like they do that oftentimes with Sokka. That they put him in a situation that makes him believe in something more than just science and reason. Do you think part of that is sort of like in like an ignorant bravery? Like he's not as scared or as worried, so he rushes out to help because maybe he doesn't have the full respect nah, the he, spirit monster. I, I, I think he knows that that spirit monster means business. <laughs> it means business. <laughs> uh, it's like a 15 round heavyweight uh, fight. Like, all right, Saki, you know what this guy's all about, right? <laughs> you watch the film? Uh, I think, I think he knows the, uh, the, you know, the, the heaviness of the situation because he's, he went, he really goes out there to help Aang out. Cause he, at this point, he, you know, he likes Aang, so he really wants to help protect him. It feels like Aang is out there by himself. So I think it's Aang. I think it's Sokka being more so courageous than being than underestimating the spirits. There, this is completely unrelated to anything. But we had that scene earlier where Iroh is being censored by Suko's hand. So my dog just jumped yeah. up on my couch and just perfectly in a way where my head is censoring his his stuff. And it just, it just <laughs> like he did it all on his own. You can't see it right now. You'll see it later. It's pretty enjoyable. Yeah. So nothing to do with anything. Just kind of funny. So yeah, mm-hmm. Sokka is trying to help. He's doing a good thing and he gets taken back. And now we spend the next several minutes watching Aang try to figure out how to get into the spirit world. If I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah. So Aang is, he's sort of, which is kind of confusing, honestly, in this episode, he's sort of trapped. Mm-hmm. In between the spirit world and the living world, which maybe he's trapped because he is a spirit and a human, and during Winter Solstice, or I don't, I don't, I really don't know the logic behind him not fully being in the spirit world, but he's still a spirit. Instead of being a bridge oh. to both, at this point he's sort of disconnected <laughs> in both. He's in sort of a, a limbo where yeah. he's mm-hmm. not in the spirit world, but they can't see him or hear him or anything either in the real world. Yeah, but they do say he's in the spirit world, which I don't know if that's just bad. I don't know if that's just inconsistent verbiage because he's not really, he's still in the human world, but he is a spirit. So I don't know. Who says it? Do you remember? Um, He says, because he's talking to, I think he's talking to himself. I think he's talking to Momo or someone. He's like, oh, I'm in the spirit world. So maybe it's just a lack of awareness at that point from him. True. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good point. Because I thought he the just, same thing that he, he just it. he just doesn't. Yeah. He just doesn't know. Because <laughs> no one has ever taught him. That's coming. He's just like, oh, I'm in the spirit yeah. world, and later on, you know, someone else is like, you idiot, you weren't in the spirit world. <laughs> when he talks to <laughs> Avatar Roku later on, Roku's like, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, so naive. No, thanks. So naive. Gosh. You think this is really what the spirit world will just look like a real world? <laughs> Where nobody like, can seriously, talk to you. Aang? Put your brain on, Gosh, son. I can't believe, can't believe I was reincarnated into this idiot who thinks it's in the spirit world. He's gonna pull out the classic dad move, like use your common sense, son. Like one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, yeah. So then this dragon um, flies up, and I, don't, I I feel like I'm forgetting something important in here, but essentially the dragon flies up and helps take Aang into the actual spirit world. But I don't really remember what triggers it. 
I watched this yesterday or the Does day he? before. I should. Well, no, I don't think he even takes him to the spirit world. He just takes him. He and the dragon is Fang. Um, Aang figures once the dragon touches him, he figures that oh, that's Roku spirit guide the way Aqua is for me. Um, not spirit guide, animal guide, which I feel like guide is a loose word, really just animal pet. The it avatar. It is just a word. It's not like official <laughs> avatar fight. lingo. Like every <laughs> avatar doesn't have to have a guide or anything like that. Just uh, I think to... I think every avatar has like a pet, or or I don't know. So far, every avatar has been. Most avatars have been shown to have some type of animal with them. Uh, Juan had like this weird cat deer thing. Roku, of course, has a dragon. Aang has Aqua, and Korra has Naga. Let's be uh, honest. Juan, just really Juan has the turtle. Book that's where... all that matters. He's got the the <laughs> turtle. It's not his pet, but it's cooler True. than the weird cat yeah. deer. I never thought of it as a cat deer. I was just it's a deformed cat in my mind. <laughs> the cat has some oh. problems. That's all. <laughs> Can't wait to watch uh, that episode. But like, it's not. It's not like. It's not like those animals have a job of like. Oh, I gotta help him figure out how to be the avatar. Like they don't. They're not speaking. Like they're just animals to have with them. I'm gonna say that those are for you know for the avatar to have an attachment to not only to humans but to animals as the avatar should have to all living things. It just so that's my me. reasoning. Is is it really Momo? Is that his guide? Not, and not Appa? Like, nah, uh, Appa would be. I, uh, when I would is, think. When is well, Momo I mean, or you can ever, have multiple ones. When has Momo ever like? I mean, Momo's helped. I like Momo, but when has Momo been? It's fine. And then, yet, sorry, I think in the yet. next episode, yet. or in part, yeah, yet so far. In this episode, no, he hasn't. He, in this episode, he has use later in a very exciting yeah. way. But in previous episodes, yeah. he's been like stuck in an air vent. He exactly. uh, just eats even, he steals and... their food. Yeah, mostly to this point, he's just kind of a jerk. But he does have a use now, <laughs> finally. So maybe he could be the spirit guy, regardless. So uh, so yeah, so the dragon, uh, the dragon takes Aang to Roku's Crescent Island, and pretty much tell him, and he shows him a quick vision of a comet. Aang has no idea what that means. And he sees a picture of, uh, he sees Roku and the dragon kind of pretty much explains, but not without talking to him, that you have to talk to Roku. And to do that, you got to come here on the Witcher Solstice. Which is roughly now ish, give or take, a couple days, like two or three days yeah. or something. I think it's tomorrow. It's the next day. I think it says, oh, well, the Winter yeah, Solstice is right. tomorrow. And this is. Or the- whenever, whenever this specific episodes done they say the it's tomorrow and it's yeah, again so. it's this sort of weird ghost of christmas past and it's not a physical uh it's not any sort of physical yes. form yeah. thing it's just sort of his his uh pale blue outline kind of deal so kind of a ghost mm-hmm. looking thing kind of a spirit looking thing and so then they do go to the temple and the dragon shows him and it's a really cool sequence that i tried to find a video an existing video for on youtube mm-hmm. but i couldn't find one but where Aang realizes that it's uh, that the temple is also sort of a calendar, and how and when he's seeing how the sun, he kind of has a forward vision, a little premonition vision that shows the light crossing through the temple and then ending up on Roku's head, and he discovers mm-hmm. that it's a calendar. And I just really like that sequence, uh, just kind of a cool little visual. I wish I'd have had a video for it, but I do not. And yeah, then he does <laughs> see the light line up, and the dragon's like go to the temple, talk to him when the light, he'll appear when the light hits right on its forehead and you'll have a few minutes and it's important, which is only weird to me because like the dragon can talk to him right now, but Roku can't talk to him right now. seems a little unfair. Well, it's I not, mean, it's the dragon plot. can't oh, like I call it a tell plot. him. <laughs> I call it a plot but... convenience. It's not a plot hole. It's something done just for the convenient sake of moving on a plot along, even if it's not hugely impactful. Dragon can't deliver exposition. <laughs> it's dragon code. <laughs> let's, let's yeah. We're side characters. That's funny. We don't get to do that. <laughs> yeah. and, and the movie that should not be named, I've named it. Um, <laughs> instead of Aang <laughs> talking to... Instead of Aang talking to Avatar Roku, like they replace 
because Avatar Roku is kind of the like the spirit telling Aang what he needs to do, which we'll get to that. Um, but instead of Avatar Roku in the movie, he just uses the dragon, but he makes it seem like the dragon is a a spirit that helps all the avatars because the dragon's like, where have you been? Like the dragon legit talks, and the, he's and like the, the manifestation of all avatars in a in a single creature uh, kind of thing. I mean, no, he's just like a guide. I guess more of an actual animal guide. Um, but he's a spirit in a spirit world, and he talks to Aang and set. And he he pretty much delivers that exposition, but I I hate it. In the movie, is he a yeah, good-looking dragon? Scary. Character? Uh, I mean, he's not Game of Thrones. I yeah. think is he's no. I'm gonna say no because he's mostly in shadow because they were cheap with it. Uh, you don't even see him full fledged. You pretty much just see his head and like his neck. So no, I'm gonna say it's crappy. If you show a dragon in a movie, you better. Don't... <laughs> yeah, that's, just, that's probably most people's whole reason for watching that movie. It's not like everybody that saw that movie is like, "Oh, I love that cartoon." Some of them's like, "I bet there's a dragon in it," and then they win. And all they see is this stupid dragon in the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of. It's no Game of Thrones. It's like there's and there's three dragons that don't give exposition like a good dragon should. They're following Dragon Code yeah. and just being side <laughs> characters. Good, good for them. Good for them. Good dragon. I, uh, we are. You can't see where I just pointed to. Uh, yeah. No, you're. Uh, oh, I keep forgetting that my screen isn't as big as everybody else's. Yeah, you're good. There's right Drogo there. in the background somewhere. Okay. Hanging out back there. Oh, we are almost through <laughs> season three of that right now so uh so daenerys just like acquired her army <laughs> and they're marching along and um yeah those hey spoiler are... alerts for game of thrones yeah but like i didn't even say what army or nothing it's fine Whatever. that's true okay i'm the last person in the world to watch everything so i can never give a spoiler yeah. it's impossible i never watch anything on time <laughs> although when i did this dragon quest 11 review that's only been out for uh, you know, a week and a half, and that's never really happened to me before. Like, I had to be careful <laughs> to not put spoilers. Like, this is never... I've never had to worry about spoilers before for anything ever. It's weird. Anyway, those dragons are good-looking dragons. So, the next scene is... It cuts away to Suko and Iroh again. And it's basically Zuko going to rescue Iroh from these earthbenders. And... Yeah, before that, um, Iroh does... He is very sly. Like he is leaving clues behind, little breadcrumbs. Um, and the part that I, I really loved, because it's a little bit of exposition, but it's done really well, that you might not even consider it exposition, because um, also it doesn't come back for a while, is that you know they, they say, he's like, oh, where are you taking me? And they're like, we're taking you to the place that wouldn't yield to you. I'm like, oh, Ba Sing Se. <laughs> and they're like, they, oh, before they say, you've laid siege to it for 600 days. But it would not yield to you. And then yeah, he goes, Oh, Ba Sing Se. Well, I fully admit my defeat at Ba Sing Se. After six hundred days, my men were tired and wanted to go home. <laughs> He's like, I'm tired now. He goes to sleep. But I love that And he just falls oh, off the horse to the yes, falls. whatever just those things casually no, let's pick them up. Those Velocity um, horse things, whatever they are. <laughs> what are they? They look Yeah, but that uh, I think they're like chicken, something. They look a little bit like the the big chicken thing. horses, chicken, uh, like the chocobos in <laughs> Final Fantasy. That's what they look like. Not exactly. In fact, not really at all. It's just what they make me think of. I should be more clear with my language. <laughs> it's a giant chocobo. But uh, there's that little exposition that oh, Iroh was a legit general, and he. You know, was trying to lay, you know, lay siege to a huge earth, earth bidding city. But he's still a good guy right now for some reason. He's still a little, you're still rooting for him. Even then, you sort of get in a, a feeling that his approach to that was kind of workmanlike. You know, it's not as if he decided to go lay siege to the city. And I'm not trying to defend him or any fire <laughs> people, but it's not like he went up as like, hey, can I go try to take over Ba Sing Se? Is that cool? It's like, no, he was. He had a job in an army in a nation that he lived in and stuff that he may or may not have believed in. We don't, maybe he just had to pay the bills. We don't know. And yeah. uh, that job was too good. Well, so I have, I have like a, a quick theory about this, and this is spoiler for future episodes coming up, but everyone watching has probably seen the show. Um, 
So Arrow says, you know, right before they depart for right, right before they depart for Susan's Comet, he says, um, you know, as a child, I had a vision that one day I would take Ba Sing Se. You know, but I didn't know that it would be to take it back from the Fire Nation. So I mean that's the thing about destiny is that you don't ever really know what your destiny is, or you know, you see a sign, you see one thing, but really destiny wants you to see another thing. So he had that vision. So I think he had in his head, like, oh no, I'm going to take Ba Sing Se because that is my destiny to take Ba Sing Se. Um, and so I think I think even though Iro was he was always kind of a lovable person, I think he was always completely fine with with the Fire Nations um with their war until one, it failed and he lost his son. And I think losing his son really changes, it really changes the whole outcome, the whole entire show. Um, Cause once he loses his son, he's like, maybe my vision was wrong. Like I forced this destiny upon my own son and he's died for Like what, what is this war even for? Although I say that, but before that he became he met with the dragons because he was already called the dragon of the West by that point. Um, so maybe all of that meeting the dragons and then the war and the sun dying, all that led to him finding a new quest in life, maybe then becoming a member of the white Lotus and everything. So now I'm writing my own freaking fan fiction, but <laughs> there's, I mean, we're on a podcast about a cartoon. You can write a fun, <laughs> you can write a fan fiction if you want. That's fine. I would, but point being, I think Iroh legitimately was fine with the Fire Nation's role in the war, knowing that they were bad because he thought his destiny was to do something. And that's why he's always on to Zuko, because he's on to Zuko saying, you think you know your destiny, but is it your destiny or is it a destiny someone has forced upon you? The same way Iroh has forced forced his own destiny onto Lieutenant, his son, but his son died for it. Like, destiny is a funny thing. I mean, he says that all the time. So I think two lessons here. First of all, go make, go make your own destiny, kids, older folks watching this. Go make your own destiny. Second of all, I think the, and I'd never thought about this, but it makes sense that Iroh, them having Iroh's son die sort of provides us this opportunity to kind of rationalize these things. Like, oh, yeah, there was a, there was a good reason for him to change directly impacted by his decisions that sort of has led to him being the softer character that we know now. Like that that kind of gives credence mm-hmm. to all these rationalized ideas we have about how maybe Iroh is not such a bad guy and I wonder why, oh yeah, this. So good, good, uh, it sounds terrible to say that. Good reason for his son to die, right? So he can change. No, but in the in the context <laughs> of the show, maybe that's sort of the reason that they had it work that way and then that also aids his relationship with Zuko being more like mm-hmm. another son. So... Interesting. I hadn't thought about that in a long, and at this point in the show, uh, I mean, we don't know that he's dead yet, but he's he's dead. So yeah, we have no idea. He, he hasn't talked about him. Yeah. He hasn't brought him up at all. So, yeah, so Iroh leaves the sandal. He falls off the giant chocobo. He leaves the sandal for Zuko to find. Zuko picks it up, smells it. He's like, that's definitely Uncle Iroh. And so yeah, Zuko... Which he keeps. He does keep it, so that's kind of polite. Yeah. And so <laughs> then... And then Iroh actually does make another escape attempt even still. He has them, like, tighten up the handcuffs uh, because they're jingling around. Isn't that so sly? It, it is, but, like, if you're the Earth uh, the Earth Nation people, the Earth Nation militia there, like, you deserve everything you got. Like, don't listen to it. If he's a little uncomfortable, you're like, no, he's a firebender who apparently can breathe heat out of his nose. So but, does that also make him an airbender? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of there's honestly a lot of gray area with with that because airbenders. The thing is, every bending can not only manipulate as in you know move their element, but they can also control the temperature of that element. And that's not something outrightly stated, I think, in the show, but it's display. Like water benders can make steam, and they can also make ice. Airbenders can make coal. Like there's one point when Aang is trying to break someone out of a chain and he breathes on the chain to form ice around it like he was just making it way colder and to form ice um also tenzin way 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 down the line big spoilers an airbender somewhere at some point 
says, oh, an airbender can warm their body just by controlling the heat in their in their breath. If they're like off in a cold peak mountain somewhere. And then, of course, firebenders can have different varying heats. And then we learn later that um, in Korra, spoiler alert, that earthbenders can turn earth into molten lava, which that probably is very rare because earth is the most stubborn element. Like it's hard to structurally change the temperature of earth. Um, so it's, I think different elements can do the same thing, but in different ways. There's gray areas. That's all you need to worry about. And that's one of them. So there's, there's areas. Yeah. yeah. Iroh, Iroh makes an escape attempt that involves him like super heat in his handcuffs, burning an earthbender's hand. And then he escapes and rolls down, which, by the way, chaining up a firebender doesn't really seem like that's going to do much. Good. Like, can't he still bend? Yeah, you can still just like... He does it with his feet. He, like, does a little, like, jump kick and fire bends yeah. out of his feet. So I know he can still use his hands, so it's kind of stupid, but whatever. He, he slides down a hill, they recapture him, and then they, like, redouble their efforts to, hey, we, he's going to kill us or we're going to lose him or something. <laughs> And so Iroh is fighting the good fight over there. And then, so then we go back to the spirit in the forest and we're kind of winding down on the first episode here where Aang has received the message and now he kind of figures out how to maybe uh, put some sense into Heibai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, we didn't even speak about it before when Aang was really upset about the, oh, we the, didn't. You know, oh, that's the forest being burnt down. Miss scene. Katara consoles him. Says, <laughs> "Katara says, hey, Aang, want me to cheer you up?" And then, <laughs> and then she just throws <laughs> throws an acorn at his head, like, and then and Saga's like, "Ha ha!" And then she throws one at him, and uh, she's like, "This acorn will, you know, all these acorns on the ground will one day become trees, um, and then when well, they get planted in earth, and they'll become trees, and the forest will rebuild itself." And that did cheer up Aang. Um, so then Aang goes to Heibai, and he just shows him the acorn. And then Heibai takes it, and then he transforms back. or well, not back, but he transforms into uh, a panda. Nice little fluffy panda. And it just happens to be that, so when all this happens, and so Aang's now kind of returned to his, his human form, so to speak, and, but when he when mm -hmm. his spirit sort of re-enters his human physical form, he's kind of sitting atop this totem pole in the middle of the dead yeah, forest. Yeah, I don't know. I got there. That is, uh, yeah, I don't know either. But it's cool. It's a <laughs> it's a totem pole of the panda, and so there's somebody found a lifeless body. It was like, no, oh, let's just this is my opportunity to prop him up. it up here. Yeah, <laughs> and stick him very safely. You know, there might be a breeze or something. But yeah, so then he's atop the for it. The panda's a panda shaped totem pole and he realized that it was the spirit's home the forest was the spirit's home and he was upset so he shows him hey it's okay it's gonna grow back and then the spirit's like all right and then Sokka <laughs> reappears somehow and i don't even remember how that happens either i just feel like he reappears i think hey by was hey by kind of how about goes back into like the forest and then like a bunch of bamboo trees sprout up and then I think oh, he just kind of released right. them. And then they all, because him and several other earthbenders, or people, sorry, people of that uh, of that mm -hmm. village, start coming through these uh, the bamboo vines at the entrance of the village. So, yeah, kind of a neat moment. It's a little touching. Mm -hmm. Lots of families reunited, uh, reunited with other family members. And you get to see the backside of a cute fluffy panda. So that's pretty exciting. And it's just a regular panda. Yeah. He's not like a two-part animal or nothing. He's just a regular panda. Unless he's a spirit is, panda. He's a spirit, though. He's a spirit yeah, he's panda. A spirit panda. <laughs> it's a very so. rare breed of panda. <laughs> if you've not gone to the zoo to play with the spirit pandas, you, you've you got to try it. But go on a day where you can see them. It's much more fun. Spirit pandas are an endangered species. There's, there's probably only one of them, for all I know. <laughs> probably. And so... Uh, uh, oh, we didn't explain that... Did we explain that Zuko came and he rescued Iroh? Or I they think... both fought against, uh, against the Earthbenders. And it's kind of, and like we've mentioned before, it's kind of uh, after they defeat them, which I do enjoy that fight scene. It's um, a good fight scene, yeah. And I think it's really short, but I think it, it really displays Earthbenders' uh, style, especially compared to uh, the firebending style. Zuko does a uh, spin a again. 
another oh, we lost track of the spinner <laughs> that's got to be at least three right there it's bare minimum. it's at least it's at least three that i'm gonna a bare minimum that it's three spinner Rooney's. yeah i think it's three um because there's kiyoshi when he was on kiyoshi island against general Zhao, and right now so that's it's at least three i might be missing another one um and so like it's 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 kind of a weird, like, they're getting along really well. Like, it's a weird Zuko. Like, I've never seen Zuko this content before. And he's like, like, Zuko does a firebending technique, and Iris says, good form. And he says, I've had a good teacher. Like, I, I have a theory I mean, I for this beat. that makes more sense than the last theory that I proposed. <laughs> this one's more thoughtful. And that's just that he's a, so he's been failing at his mission, essentially. And this is a distraction it's a new mission, something that's take, taken priority, and he's succeeding. It feels good. You know, you, you've essentially gone from losing for, for years to now you're doing something <laughs> a little bit different. Like I said, yeah. you shifted priorities, and, and he's winning. He's <laughs> that's funny. good self-confidence again. So it is, that reminds me of a human side of Zuko. That reminds me of a, a DC story, Injustice. Um where uh and it's not really swear this thing is like five years old but where uh, superman kills yeah he, he he has superman accidentally kill lois lane and also blow up metropolis and batman's entire game afterwards he's like why why superman it's always been about me and you and he's like bats i always lose to you and for once i want to play this game on easy mode <laughs> it's just like <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. You know uh, what? Joker, was like, Joker's a man. He deserves a dub once in a while. Deserves a dub. Yeah. Now. Oh, I mean, and then Superman. Oh, it's such a great comic book. Um, so in it, and like Batman's like, what do you think you're going to accomplish? He's like, listen, something terrible happened to, something happened to us both to make us who we are. Something terrible. You know, what do you think is going to happen to, and we're humans. What do you think is going to happen to Superman when something terrible happens to him? And Batman being confident, he's like, I know he's going to be the great, outstanding man he's going to be. And then the Nets, like, the Nets strip in the comic book is just Superman punching a hole through Joker. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a clip right here. I just like, something to bring up. Boom, like, there it is. Like, if this, if this is his body, this is Superman's hand through his body. That's how the comic looks. It's kind of graphic. <laughs> but just blood... Just all. That's kind of graphic. I, I was picturing more cartoony. Yeah. Huh? I have nightmares, probably. No, it was. Oh, horrifying. Yeah. And, uh, well, anyway, back to the touching part of the story. <laughs> I uh, I do have a little bit of a qualm with this fight scene. I, so I like that it's the, it's the second time where you kind of get to see Iroh's real power. Like, it, sure, he's this short, nice, chubby guy. Uh, but then it's yeah. the second time where you get to see a fuller extent and display of his powers beyond firebending like just into martial artistry and that's pretty cool and like i said i maintain that there is a significance to the fact that zuko like i said is on a, is on a different mission and it's a good mission right you're driven by something good and positive and that's why a it feels more human than we've had of zuko to this point and then b of why it is they're a little more chummy they're having some fun with it like I said, they're winning they haven't won forever so that feels good. <laughs> and that basically is the end of that episode. I believe the actual end is the villagers coming yeah, back. Pretty, so I, I got my scenes flip-flopped in there. That's my fault. Yeah, and pretty much Aang now knows he needs to... Well, yeah, we've explained this. He needs to go to uh, Avatar Roku uh, during the winter solstice. On a crescent-shaped island, which he explains. He's like, all right, got to go to this crescent-shaped island. Got to visit this temple. I'm going to talk to Roku. And they're like, all right, let's do it. And he's like, hold on. I got some bad news. It's in the fire. Nation. It's in the fire. Nation. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end, he even tries to leave without him. I think him. Like he's talking uh, I think that's the beginning the of the, of the next night. episode. Beginning of this. Okay. So this is part two. Now this yeah. part two is called avatar Roku. And I don't know what I got here. Yeah. So he's trying to leave without him. And then they wake up and they're like, yeah, we're going with you. Stop being stupid again. God, Aang is the stupidest <laughs> avatar. Apparently. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> it's, it's good. 
It's going to be one of my criteria when we do a thing that involves criteria about avatars. It's going to be one of them is not being stupid. So they, they set off to go to the fire temple. And... Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And the first real thing that happens is that both they and uh, Suko and Iroh are both engaging... Uh, they're both about to enter Fire Nation territory. Suko and Iroh in a ship, and then Aang and Sokka and Katara and Appa through the air. Uh, yeah, I think the great thing about this, especially this part of the episode, is that they, you know, there's definitely stakes to it. There's definitely some, there's definitely a risk in like every single scene. I think there's some risk involved. Like, you, like you legit don't know how they're gonna make it. Um, I do really enjoy the scene where they gotta go through the Fire Nation blockade. Like Appa looks like he means, he means business or he means no business or business, or whatever. He's not playing around. Uh, and he's straight up doing like, like jet all... maneuvers too. Like he he's, he's yeah. listing lazily left and then listing lazily. No, he's like yeah. he's straight up doing, doing barrel jet rolls. Maneuvers. Do a barrel roll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. great tie-in. So um, you can't hear it. And then Zuko. It. Yeah, no. And Zuko. Because uh, he went to the same village I read, he found out where they were going, and and they are definitely heading into Fire Nation territory. And Uncle Iroh is warning him. He's saying, "Zuko, out of all of the, out of your like 16 years of living, this has to be the dumbest thing you've ever done." Don't be like, Aang. He's like you use can't. your brain." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you are banished. He's like. And, and Zuko thinks, well, you know, as long as I capture the avatar, my father will understand. Zuko's like, my brother, Iroh's like, my brother is not that understanding. Like, you have been banished from the Fire Nation. It's funny because Zuko really doesn't have like a, like a homecoming feeling. He's he's just really straightforward. Like, I I have to get through this blockade. Um, and Iroh's warning him the whole time. And so, like I said before, great scene, uh, especially the clouds. I really loved the. The animation of the, of the clouds and just the maneuvering in and out of it, fireballs coming out of, uh, coming out of nowhere. Appa having to dodge them, Aang also air bending at them, um, and they finally make it through. Um, they make it through the blockade, and uh, Admiral Zhao, or whatever his name is, whatever his rank is at this point, is <laughs> I think he's a commander at this point. Yeah, he's he, a commander. He at this has point. not received the third promotion or whatever that's yeah. in a few episodes yeah uh commander Zhao allows zuko to come by knowing that zuko will lead him to the avatar so i have to i have to step backwards here a little bit just because i forgot to bring it up it's not a huge point but in in the previous episode can iroh see the dragon or did he just sense the oh dragon? you know what we didn't even, yeah, we didn't even mention yeah, that. Did he, no, Iroh can did legit... he see it, or did he just sense it because he's like he could feel it fly by him, like he he knows because he's very wise, or could he straight up see that? No, he could straight up see the dragon, um, and that is another. Yeah, I mean, we didn't mention it, but that kind of shows that oh, Iroh is, is special. Like he's a little, you know, his spirit his spirit awareness is really high. That he legit just see Aang find on the dragon. And that's something that doesn't uh, he come react, He looks up and he reacts to it. Uh, that's Yeah, and, I mean, yeah, because uh, much later, you know, Admiral Zhao talks him, like, oh, I've heard about your journey to the spirit world, which also, you know what, we don't really ever learn about his journeys to the spirit world. No, but like, I we, think we know they're just there that's... to plant the seed of what happens, like, yeah. or to give you the concept of that there's something... Now it, at least in this now series, I'm there's something extra special. Uh, disappointed because I forgot to talk talk about it, or disappointed that it doesn't. Uh, I'm, have I'm a disappointed deep... that we don't we don't ever learn what happened to Iroh. Like, like you know, like I previous talked about Iroh's past. Like at some point in there, Iroh takes a trip to the spirit world. Like I wonder did those couple of things coupled together make him change his disposition on the war like his son died his son died and he went um, through a time of such grief and such deep meditation yeah maybe i'm about to go real dark that achieved, he, he, achieved that he considered <laughs> I, I was about to go much darker that he considered and this isn't this is <laughs> this is not a hypothesis it's just a thought oh, 
I just thought like maybe he had like suicidal thoughts, which I hope no one out there has suicidal thoughts. Um, that maybe just took him such a deep, low level that he somehow spiritually awakened. Like it's interesting because when in later on episodes, a certain avatar reaches her lower lowest point. And that kind of awakens her spirituality that she can then uh, help her connect. And then someone says, "Once you've reached your, <laughs> somebody, <laughs> you know, once you, yeah, somebody, once you've reached your lowest point, you then can become more spiritual aware." Um, so maybe that had to do with it. I mean, like like what you're saying that he reached such a low point that maybe he opened up his spiritual awareness, and maybe that made him journey into the spirit world. So maybe that couple with his son dying, couple with meeting the dragons. It's like, I'm on the wrong side of history here. He, uh, it really is like a ghost of Christmas past thing where he like sees like, all right, you met these dragons, your son's dead, you're, you're <laughs> hitting rock bottom, and then you go on this journey through quote unquote spirit world, and then you change yeah. your ways. Like, it's just a Christmas show. Yeah, which we never learned what happened there. It doesn't, um, it also doesn't tie in this, so he sees the dragon fly by, and you think that something really profound is going to happen, but it really doesn't. After the dragon flies by, that's just when he starts his escape plan. But it's not like the yeah, dragon he, he... like gave any other <laughs> inter- like, hey, this is how you should escape. Like he just he saw it and he's like, oh, I can yeah. escape now. Like it, it's, it doesn't connect to anything here yet. It's just and he cool. kind of he kind of ignores it. <laughs> yeah, he does. He just kind of brushes it off. Like, oh, this uh, avatar is close by. I think maybe yeah. maybe not. So it doesn't. I think that's why. I forgot about it. It's because it doesn't really have any other impact. Yeah, it doesn't factor. Yeah, it doesn't factor in anything. It is it, in this point. It's it tell us something that, that we special. learn about about mm-hmm. Iro. Yeah, which Pick I guess up. really in that episode we learned more about Iro than I think is 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 a uh, really clear. Like we learned we learned that he was a general. He laid siege to a place, and for some reason, he can see spirits. Yeah, well, and we we learn more in a deeper level that I probably didn't uh, probably didn't think about the first time I watched this. So good, good for us thinking deep. And then the second point I had, that I need to make is that uh, well, I do I I hate all Star Fox games. First of all, sorry, other Star Fox nerds, I despise all of them. But uh, did you know there is a do a barrel roll Yu Gi Oh card? I did from, from our many from our many years of Yu Gi Oh. Okay, that's really all I had to say. Yeah. Just thought that was funny. So. <laughs> Sorry, I had to step back. I totally <laughs> forgot the dragon piece. If I was good at audio editing, I'd cut this part out and put it back where it should be, but I'm too lazy and stupid to do that, Man. so I'm not going to do that. But yeah, cool part. And now, wizened, spiritually uh, aware, Uncle Iroh is warning Zuko, don't do this. You might think that your brother will for- or that your father will forgive you because you're on a mission, and that seems admirable and noble, uh, but he is not an understanding person he'll probably just kill you he doesn't say that but like there's a little hint there's like something bad is gonna happen (laughs) and then so next they they get to the crescent island um oh yeah so they went through the blockade and everything yeah i kind of we we already talked about that i missed but basically (laughs) they use uh so zhao lets a buy you mentioned and -hmm. then he intends to follow them and then also they're firing fireballs in the sky at Appa, but Appa's doing his crazy blue angels maneuvers, and it's pretty fun. <laughs> and there's a fun picture of one of these crazy blue angels maneuvers. And oh, yeah. Something. Yeah, it's good. I, I like that. That whole scene was very, very exciting in a Top Gun way. And then what happens? Oh, and they actually arrive at the fire temple. Got it. <laughs> yeah, they arrive at the fire temple, and Sagan and Tara's like, oh, we did it. We're, we're in a fire nation. Like, they never expected especially right now to be in the fire nation um so then they they get there they get to the temple they meet the sages who are like we are the five sages who serve serve the avatar and Aang is like good i'm the avatar we know and then they fire ben at them cut the commercial <laughs> pretty much yeah cut the commercial yeah. as they as they do right. i do wonder how this new show is going to handle um handle not having cut you know those cut commercial times because they you know they purposely build those moments of like a little bit of anticipation a little bit of a mini cliffhanger um so how would it's funny because the director of this specific episode is the director uh maybe slash creator of dragon prince um so i wonder how they're gonna 
handled that, mm-hmm. not having that same cliffhanger to hold you over. That's a good point. They use it to build drama, and then, I mean, you can't leave uh, when you hit those dramatic points, right? That keeps you glued to your chair. <laughs> Gotta sit and watch the stupid yeah. commercials. So, yeah, sages, turns out, not uh, not great guys. Kind of some grumpy old men no, action no. going on there. <laughs> But one of them is good. Uh, and they then they run. run in... Yeah. Yep. I forget what the... I forget what his name is. But they run into a good one. Uh, I don't remember. I'm sure he has a name. It's probably a nice name. But he explains. He kind of gives Aang a little bit of backstory. Like, hey, they you've been gone a long time. They they fell off the beaten path, <laughs> and they might have been killed had they not opposed you, or if I hadn't pretended to. But he leads them on a shortcut, yeah. and they do trust him. And he kind of leads him on a shortcut toward the sanctuary. Oh, I kind of skipped over a part there, but um... awesome. Uh, one thing I do—it's it's another. Const- he gives another constant reminder, of, like to Aang, that Aang has failed. <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, the Fire Sages were loyal to Roku, and we waited for the next Avatar, but he never showed. <laughs> so then they just started. <laughs> they were forced to uh, be with the Fire Lord." I was like, Aang, you would have showed up, but you didn't. They would have been loyal to you. I mean, you I'm not trying to point fingers, idiot. <laughs> but this being very yeah. hard on Aang this episode. Because why is he talking to Aang as if he's in, you know, third person? Like, oh, well, we're waiting, but he didn't show up. Like, why didn't you just say, but you didn't show up? Maybe that would have been too judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. This this fire sage has been locked up in a temple. I don't, you know, I don't know how uh, temple uh, temple guardians work, but if it's anything like Yu Gi Oh, then this guy has just been in that temple his whole life. I can assume it's exactly like Yu Gi Oh, right? And so, like, he doesn't actually. He's not all that worldly, so he probably isn't a hundred percent sure it's the Avatar yet. Other than these other sages being like, "Is that the Avatar? Yeah, it's the Avatar. Okay, we decided that's him." <laughs> And that's really all he's got to go out. So maybe there's a trust a trust thing on both sides there. Because they definitely don't trust him right away. And then maybe he likewise yeah. isn't quite positive there either. I added this other scene here called Zuko Smokescreen. Basically, we, we already kind of talked a little bit about it. They know, mm-hmm. Iroh and Zuko know that Zhao is going to follow them. And so amid all this horrible fire, their ship's on fire because it got hit by one of those projectiles. And so Suko drops out a little, like a little tugboat out of the back of his boat, a little lifeboat, <laughs> and just to see if he can escape Zhao, Zhao's pursuit and go off on his own. He's using the smoke as a literal smoke screen. So crafty. I mean, it, it, it's crafty. Um, in the end, it's kind of unnecessary, and that's a scene that bothers me. That I'll, yeah. But whatever. That's true. Now we get to my favorite part of this episode. Eh, yeah, so he gets to the temple. Part. He gets to the uh, temple where uh, Roku statue is at, and Aang needs to see Roku statue. But it is, it takes five fire bending masters or fully realized avatar to open up because they have like these dragons. You got to fire bend into them, similar to the doors in the Southern Air Temple where you got to air bend into them. Uh, it takes bending to do so, and but they don't have. Aang's not a fully realized avatar, and they don't have four other firebenders. So Sokka does come up with a great scheme to put little bombs in them and to light them all at the same time for them to blow up. Um, and I really enjoy that because something I haven't realized until really watching, until doing this podcast, is how many freaking plans and schemes they have, they've had to come up with <laughs> throughout this time. Like, we're only on, like, episode eight or something, and Sokka has legit have to come up with, like, sits different schemes which i think is just and also other people have come with different schemes or plans how to do stuff which i think is just great writing for a kids television show to put in that oh our characters have to be smart also like they can't win with just power and they can't win with just love or whatever other kids shows <laughs> whatever with, or just willpower after school special um, crap but like they didn't <laughs> through the power of music <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> is that the high school musical mantra? That's how the world yeah. is saved. Exactly, um, but they didn't. They didn't, you know, pander to to little kids or you know to the lowest common denominator and, and completely omit like being intelligent. 
Like they have to come up with plans all the time. And these are legit good plans most of the time. The um, this one. So soccer. This one I think is his first really good one. Like he he's had some <laughs> games before, and he has one or two uh, coming up in short in short order that that are very clever. Like it kind of goes uphill from here and up. But this is the first time we're like. You know what, Saka? I know it didn't work, but that was still really like that was that was genius. Yeah. But then, uh, but then, yeah, I interrupted you. Yeah, so blowing, blown, no, it's blowing up the uh, the dragon heads didn't work. Um, but then Katara says, "Well, it looks like it worked." So then, pretty much, says Masaki, "You're a genius." And then Aang says, "You know, did the meaning of genius change in the last hundred years because it didn't work?" Um, so they pretty much say, "But it looked like it," and they can trick. Mm-hmm. The fire sages into uh into thinking angus made it in and then they have to open it so then all five of them do a fire blast to open up the uh the door and i don't know if it's because i'm watching on blu-ray but the animation of those of that locking mechanism was done really really well like i just love seeing that door open it looks, it's pretty it's tight really yeah good. it's pretty cool and finally momo has a purpose and he didn't yeah. even get stuck anywhere, so good for him. Uh, yeah, so they open it. Uh, all the five stages open it, and then pretty much it's a... It's a... It's bat, double... I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Um, it's a... Uh, they, they they betray... The, he, the fire stage guy betrayed the other four or five We've fire been stages. bamboozled. Is that um, the word you were looking for? Bamboozled. I trap. Uh, I don't uh, know what word I was looking for. It's a trap. Uh, and then, yeah, and then Momo, Momo completely attacks the face of uh... straight at the face, right? He just, <laughs> yeah. And that's the spearhead of the attack, right? Like that's the first. He jumps straight at the face, yeah. and then everybody else, like they were waiting on Momo's. They're waiting on a monkey to make the, the is... first move before they all the jump on is... their attack. There's only so there. There's only. Yeah, uh, there's only Katara, Sokka, the Fire Sage, and uh, and Aang. But Aang can't attack anybody because Aang has to get into the room. So they were really dependent on Momo attacking that fourth Fire Sage. Like, it would have been four on three instead of four on four. <laughs> Thinking of it in football terms, I mean, were they really anticipating, like, hey, Momo's got our back. He's going to take the first one, and we'll get whatever. <laughs> yeah, but... He's just a monkey, so he just gets to pick whatever one. That's fine. And then we'll take the other three. Or were they thinking like, all right, maybe the three of us can occupy the four of them. And then when Momo attacks, like, you know, that's he good for him. Thanks, Momo. Like, it was just a bonus. Momo coming in clutch. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's Mr. Mr. Solstice is what they're going to call him. Coming mm-hmm. through when they need it the most. Yeah. So good for Momo. He finally has a use that doesn't involve stealing food, basically. So good yeah. job, Momo. Uh yeah, which they wait on Aang to get in there, but Aang is captured by Zuko. And Aang just, like, he waits for the last moment to to flip it around on Zuko and use airbending to get away from him. And then he barely makes it in. And then as the door is closing, and like I said before, that the dragon mechanism closes again, and that motion looks really great in animation. Um, he finally gets in. Uh, gets in there just as the winter solstice and that little red thingy is red light is gonna shine on Roku, and uh, and Roku he finally gets to he goes to spirit world ish, yeah. See, he's in the yeah. full spirit world now. I think, like, I think he's straight up there. I think they're having the conversation. I, I mean, I wouldn't swear. Either to that or a vision. I'm gonna say he's in the spirit world. I'm gonna go with that. It feels like a first trip into the spirit world. But... Just a uh, more, it's more, personal more, opinion. Maybe it's also more of a vision. I don't know. Yeah, I think you can go. You can go with either way, whether it's in the spirit world or no, it's a vision. No, if you don't agree with us, you better stop watching the podcast right now. <laughs> if you don't agree with our differing opinions, <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> we can't decide. Um, but you should know. Yeah. Better. Well, because because there's examples in season two where I don't feel like Aang is in the spirit world. Like he comes out of his body. But Roku shows him a vision of all the past avatars. I feel like he's not in the spirit world at that point. I don't know. Whatever. Um, so, what so Roku pretty be. much explains to him. Uh, so Roku explains to him pretty much the 
the time frame that he has and exactly why he has to do by this time. So before, Boomy told us, oh, you had to defeat, you had to learn all three elements and you got to defeat the Fire Lord. Like, or restore he gave no time frame. I don't even know if he says defeat the Fire Lord. He just like restore yeah, peace or something. Yeah, he says, he says to Mordei. defeat the Fire Lord, you got to okay. think like a mad genius. Okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> so then Roku says, the comet's coming. You know, before Fire Lord Sozin used the power of the comet for the first strike against the other three nations, and then he asks, well, what does the comet have to do with it right now? Well, the comet's coming back around. Also, the comet amplifies fire beating power. Um, uh, just more, another hot, fiery rock in the sky, I guess, amplifies their power. Um, and he said he's gonna, they're going to use that to finish the war. Um, and Aang, you have to stop the, the, fire, the fire Nation by that time, because at that point, you the war, the world will be so out of balance that even the Avatar won't be able to restore balance. Um, so he pretty much tells him the urgency of the situation, of what's going to happen, and when he needs to do it. The vision... And no, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and no, av- rarely do Avatar... And I think he tells him, like, usually it takes a lifetime to learn all, all four elements. Like, you have essentially a, a year... Really more, yeah. Essentially, a year to do it. So I love the I love the spirit world scene or the vision scene, however you want to describe it. I love meeting Avatar <laughs> Roku, if you can call it that. Like he mm-hmm. he meets all Great expectations. Voice acting, by the way. Yeah, tremendous! What a voice. Um, dude, what's the guy's name? I don't know voices or actors. I Maybe. don't know. <laughs> ah, well, not important. What is important is it was he does <laughs> very well done. I was like, he does voice Alfred in an animated movie or something at one point. He, it just is a tremendous voice. It's kind of everything you would want it to be from just a, this this gruff old past old life lives. avatar, yeah. yeah. And and Fire Nation, like he still has that very, I don't know, he still has like a really dangerous feel to him. You're like that's a that's the probably the greatest firebender that you'll ever get to see on screen. Uh, but I have two issues with the this general scene. Uh, and first is that what? not not that part. No, that I'm part's not great. listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That part is great. It's what's happening outside. First of all, I don't like that Suko's smoke screen just didn't lead to anything. Like Zhao still catches up. Zhao st- yeah, still yeah. gets into the temple. Mm-hmm. Plus, like, I think everybody knew that everybody was going to the temple at a certain point. Like, they're all going <laughs> the direction of this important island with this important temple. Like, in the time, I, I think everybody knew. So I don't get the point of the smoke screen. Or I was a little upset that it didn't work better. That there wasn't more to it. Like. Like, Xiao gets there first, and then Zuko sneaks in from the other side or something. I just felt like it was a missed opportunity or unnecessary something. Second of all, I hate that they're trying to get the doors back open, the sages are, and one of them's like, yeah, Avatar Roku must not want us in there. Okay. (laughs) So y'all know in your hearts that's true, and you don't stop and think for (laughs) a second, oh, well, okay, if Roku doesn't want us to get in there, maybe this is like our come to Jesus moment where we should change our ways because the living embodiment of what we're going to call Avatar Jesus, however you want to picture him, they're, they're come to Avatar moment. Like something should have clicked there where they, they straight up acknowledge like, yeah, Roku doesn't want us in here. We serve Roku. He is our, he is a very powerful spiritual being that we worship and protect and all that stuff. Let's go ahead and try to get in anyways. What? What? Like, I can see Zhao and Zuko being jerks, but those guys, I feel like they should know better. Well, I'm more like, why Why are there even fire sages anymore? Like, why didn't they? Why didn't the fire lords just be like, nah, y'all, y'all fire, we don't have that role anymore. Well, they're just guarding, I mean, they're I, just guarding a temple, right? Uh, just guarding the sacred uh, yeah, the that's avatar. It, I, I guess. I, I, like Not letting people into the temple. But they also, should I think still the fire the sages most. are responsible for crowning the fire lords. Oh no, kidding! Like they I don't think about they, that. But, like they don't decide who's right, the but Fire Lord, but the they like are just ceremonial. Put the crown on the head. I just feel like these should be the most schooled and well educated, and to think you, like that should have been a dawning moment of you know what, if Roku doesn't want us in there, like he so <laughs> obviously doesn't, maybe it's time for us to like reform and flip the script. And so instead, <laughs> these guys are all like in denial. But I I thought to myself, what a good time to to show sort of the power of the avatar 
over people in a spiritual way than like what if they had all four just turned and be like you know what this is wrong and they just got into a huge fight with zuko and Chow. and i just thought that would have been like much more exciting and even if they got caught and they were all condemned to death condemned to death instead of going out like a bunch of pansies like oh only he was a traitor if they all had kind of gone out together with some pride with is like good guys i've it was a little unsatisfying yeah. to me. It's a it's a minor thing in a in the greater picture of stuff. I just thought it was a missed opportunity. It's like <laughs> those guys needed to come to Jesus moment, and it was right in front of their faces. Whatever, it's fine. There's Avatar Roku, and see, I, maybe it's a vision. That that looks pretty spirit world to me, but it could just be a vision of the spirit world. I get it. And then Roku hatches an ingenious escape plan because now everybody's waiting <laughs> on him. They can't get in. But Zhao's like, but he's got to come out sometimes. They're all waiting. Roku knows it. And then he devises uh, a, a cool, not highly scientific plan to get hang out of there. Well, I mean, he's Avatar. Aang is the bridge between the worlds. Also, Avatars, I can buy that spiritually they can take over their, uh, take over the new Avatar's body because they've, you know, they've done that. Um, also, it's one of those things when they get when they talk about Avatar, say they say like now you can go and <laughs> now you can uh, you know you can get the past experiences and power of your past lives. So this is just kind of part of it that I think you know Roku can now just become spiritually Ang and just have a one thing he looks huge. Like I don't know if that's just the way the camera looks. No, but when he, he looks like he is intentionally oversized. <laughs> Yeah, even though he's not that tall, like he's just a regular size, um, which I guess you know, that way you also tell he's a spirit. Um, oh, and I just love that scene where they, the doors open up and there's just these glowing eyes, and then they unleash all their fire on them. Yeah, that's, that's and then basically Roku the plan just, here. Just as a highlight, the, basically the plan is Roku's like, I'm gonna buy you some time, <laughs> um, and I can do it just for yeah. a little bit, which is his way of saying, yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, you mentioned it, take over your body. Uh, by causing the world's coolest distraction of all time, <laughs> which is what you're describing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the doors open, all you see is glowing eyes, they fire bend at it, and then it's just Roku just freaking bends all the fire and just unleashes it all back. And then it that fire doesn't burn Katara Saga, but burns off their chains. Also, it burns off Zuko's chains, and Zuko gets away. Yeah, that's a little funny thing about destiny. Worth, worth thinking it. Um, worth thinking about. Ah, I mean, Avatar Roku probably maybe knows something. Um, <laughs> he probably is privy to more information than the average uh, living person. Yeah. Um, so I think it was intentional that Zuko's chains were, you know, also freed, and he got to be let go, or he got away. Um, and then Roku just freaking demolishes the whole entire temple which is actually the second time he demolishes that temple, which once you watch that video that I sent you, you'll see that. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert! Just kidding. Oh, stop. Just kidding. I'm <laughs> yeah, kidding. Spoiler for you. This is that, sorry, that's going to uh, be a running joke for all time because I don't believe in spoilers, whereas uh, Chris uh, is very much believe in spoilers for opposite. That's yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. That's okay. <laughs> Unique differences. Uh, so he, he also lava bins which because uh, he bends up definitely there's earth like a bending. volcanoes underneath there but he's the, he's the avatar he can bend whatever he wants that's fine he's the avatar you can do it yeah, yeah exactly which some people like once once lava bending became a thing people were like well I'm confused this is crap and for me I was like oh, it's simple like earth benders can like oh are these people that's who can fire bend and earth, and earth yeah, bend? that's what that is like it's just like earth like lava is just earth that's Real That's hot, just molten earth. So of course they could bend it. Um, even if so, even if lava bending became a thing for firebenders, I would still say you know what that's okay because at a certain point, uh, all things have like fire on it. Well, and all things have a right. If you can, if you can bend coal, earthbenders. Uh, <laughs> no, but at a certain point, uh, <laughs> everything kind of has like a spontaneous combustion point. It's like you know what something gets hot enough. At some point, it can just combust anyway. Like, it's essentially fire. It's fine. So, you know what? I would say that earthbenders and firebenders could probably bend lava, and I'd be okay with that. Wouldn't bother me. It fits in the gray area description. It would be, too. It makes, it makes more sense that I think earthbenders could. Um, 
But yeah. Yeah, I think so for sure. But <laughs> it uh, it it's playing into my theory that there is at least a lot of overlap, and that it's not a static like there's not one gene split into four pieces where it's like all right, you got this exact piece. But yeah, just a theory. Anyway, even though that's disproven, so. This... <laughs> You, <laughs> no, a, no, a, we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> break this down, Chris. We're gonna go above and beyond the lore. We're gonna create our own lore. Um, I actually had a thought here, and it's funny because you're pointing out like Suko's chains fall apart. So you and I, like, we're not like especially observant or anything. I want to talk down on us. I'm just trying to like nothing really special about what we do or anything. I would love to find like a highly intelligent just hyper observant child that had watched this show like a 10 year old or something just to see if he had said like, Oh yeah, Zuko's chains fell out. That probably is going to play in. Somehow. <laughs> like I want to know if there's any 10 year olds out there watching the show with the level of depth that you have put into it. So just to, just to see, you know, but, uh, uh there's probably some I mean, the thing is when I was, there. I mean, even when, when I was probably 15, when this episode, Maybe Ariel. That like sounds roughly 15, right. Fifteen, sixteen, there. I bet. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, I remember Devin being a sophomore during. Yeah, I think I was maybe it was fifteen. I was probably fifteen. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember in my high school class, we were talking about different nations. Like, oh, United Nations. And one guy was like the Fire Nation. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you watch Avatar too? The Fire Nation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I just want to know if, like, I want to. I would love so to meet I, kids that watch this, but like getting that stuff on the first way through. Whereas I'm like, I'm 28 yeah. and watching it for the third time and still picking up on all this stuff that you have to point out <laughs> for me. I mean, me at 15, who was fairly smart for a 15 year old. Um, I mean, not like genius, just like whatever compared to i think to other people um like i don't think i picked up on on that like i kind of always knew that there was more to zuko and that i knew he would eventually lead go down a certain path um but that chains coming across that was a little suspect to me i think at the time but i was like i was like ah whatever like it didn't it didn't click for me as that being something specifically that Roku did until I watched an episode in season three. I am willing to say that it's what you do notice right away is that fire is hurting that. Yeah. His, his fire blasts mm-hmm. are hurting fire benders and not yes, non fire yeah. benders and destroying chains. So like, yeah. even if you don't go to that, like finite of detail, it is very obvious very so like, Oh, that's hurting other fire benders, but not other people. That is a special kind of fire bending. That's not some ordinary stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then in the rest of the scene, which is awesome, he literally, I'm getting very biblical this episode. He literally just, just he just destroys the tip. He like splits it in half, just pulling lava up from the center of the earth into just giant oh, columns crap. and everybody's running out. And it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's kind of biblical, the destruction of the temple. And yeah. Um, yeah. Are you talking about when, so in the Bible, when, you know, Jesus goes to, he, he, uh, there's, there's he, uh, there are multiple, uh, multiple places in the Bible where similar yeah. things happen. Uh, but my, my first one is always, <laughs> is always to think of like the gospel of where, uh, where he goes in and it's like become like a market. Like, at least, yeah, sorry, I think like people this are, are exchanging money. And, uh, cause that's similar to here. Like, Roku comes out, it's like these guys are flinging fire around inside my temple at yeah, Avatar. Exactly. That ain't right. And then he's like, that, is, yeah. that was that was the first biblical rep, but I'm not well schooled yeah. in a biblical sense. But that's the first one I thought of. Anyway, it's kind of I was like, biblical. this temple was made. You know, you're supposed to do this in remembrance of me, and you you didn't even do that. And when I locked the doors, you guys clearly should have known better. <laughs> oh, that's a sticking. That's a huge sticking point to me. If we as humans could all be so lucky to have things in our life that were so obvious like hey you should try to be a good person just punch you in the face like that if we could all be so lucky but whatever whatever that's that's too yeah. deep for for a podcast. I, think, I could i could believe it because i think people could see people who are christians could see jesus now or claim to be christian or whatever and not recognize them just uh, well, that's... 
that that scene it seemed so blatant so obvious like y'all y'all should know better y'all should know better they knew it was him and so what's left okay so roku gets Aang out of the temple and it's really cool goes up in flames it's awesome there you can see it oh, in the yeah, background that's kind of t- i wanted one with like the columns coming out of it but like from this angle but it never really happens all the columns of lava coming up that's all inside the temple so it didn't capture quite what i wanted that's all right uh, great scene i should have captured it on video and put it here that as you i uh, didn't mean to put that up right away that brings us to our commercial break mm-hmm. um which the only reason i brought this up this is actually from <laughs> another youtube video and this looks like the toy that you have it looks like the yeah Seiko it's pretty that much it's that's exactly it and uh there's actually a youtube video and so i i just went to youtube i type in avatar the last airbender <laughs> toys just looking for fun stuff and this comes up and it's actually a really neat channel. It's called Wallace Toy Reviews. Wallas, sorry, W-A-L-L-A-S. It's on the bottom there. This is neat channels where they just kind of random odds and ends toys. Just, it, it reminded me a lot of the way you speak. Like, he was really big into how um, how you could articulate <laughs> Suko's arms and everything. Like, the same things that you valued in toys. This, va- this guy valued in toys as well. And then he had a long list of videos. So then I got looped into just watching videos about all these toys uh, in in great depth, that was very exciting to me. And it just looks like a tool, cool toy. And then maybe most importantly is because since this is a two part episode, I was like, I gotta have something that doesn't take very long to talk about. So <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> We've been talking for a while now. <laughs> and so that was really my only commercial. We're in something quick and short. That brings us on to right. the ratings. And I'm gonna let you go first because I always <laughs> go first and I steal a lot of your thunder. And I think you're gonna have better things to say. So, yeah, I'm going to let you go first this time. All right, uh, audio-visual. Uh, the thing is, if I would have split these episodes into into uh, into two parts, it it would have... Like the, second ep- the first episode would have just gone down, and the first episode would have gone down, and the second episode would have just gone up. Um, but I really enjoyed the audio-visual in this, like I've mentioned before. Um, when they were getting um, Hey By, was I think was really well animated just his motion was really cool um and then i think the the animation really stands out in part two when whether it was the uh, roku just completely destroying the temple um um oh that the dragon mechanism thing i was just for some reason i was really blown away with that even though that's a fairly small part of it uh, just, of, of the whole show really detailed know, it was just done really nice like you could see like every single little uh just every single little mechanism over there just like a little clock like a bunch of different, different clocks um so for audio visual gave that an eight and a half out of ten for story i went <laughs> i went back and forth on to whether to give this uh an eight or an eight and a half so I, I gave you my my scores, and then like I tested you later. No, I changed to eight and a half. And then right after that, I changed it to eight. Uh, I think part one is more so like a seven or seven and a half, where um, it's it's. I mean, a lot of it's set up, and I think the story in itself isn't like a, a isn't all that important. It doesn't have a huge ramifications for later on. Um, and even for a self-contained story, like it's a good story that hey, things will be better. You know, here's an acorn. Uh, respect the environment, stuff like that. Um, but the <laughs> the Zuko, Iro stuff. Although now that I think about it, like we talked about, it just those little tidbits spans a lot on Iro. But I think that's more so us fishing, mm-hmm. and also being able to look retroactively at this episode, knowing what's coming, uh, what's coming ahead. We've talked for so almost think, two hours about forty minutes of television. I think that classifies as fishing a little. Yeah. Uh, so part one would have got seven. Uh, part two would have got a nine. I, I just I love it as an episode in of in of itself because it's it's uh, it continuously has stakes, continuously um, puts our characters in peril. It I feel like it leads on a lot of different cliffhangers. Uh, which I think is just kind of really great storytelling that there are stakes, there are things that happen, things are really important happening. Um, so and we also learned a huge, a lot about just, oh, we learned what Aang 
we've already learned what Anakin has to do, and now we know when he has to do it and why he has to do it so immediately. Um, so I gave story an eight. Um, then on memorable, I gave it a. Oh, sorry. Stalling for because I it's didn't. Kevin, I think it's I gave Kevin. it an eight. There we go. Yeah, it's an eight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gave an eight. Uh, part one, I don't. I don't find all that memorable. Honestly, I can always skip it because I, I always get the gist of it, and it's really just set up. In part two, I love part two. This this was like our first introduction to a full blown what a full say avatar can do. You know, when, as we're gonna see in future episodes, um, whenever they show avatars, just what their full potential, their power is, and that's always a key scene. Whenever Roku takes over Aang's body, always love that scene. It took this show up another level for me now there's a couple of different episodes it takes to show up a level um, or different moments and that's one of those moments um, but like I said it gets only gets this whole episode only gets eight because I think part one weighs it down I'm just looking at part two probably would have gotten like a nine so and then that breaks me out to a 8.2 out of 10 and for reference I don't want to steal uh, steal any future thunder that is actually your let me check I think that was just your second highest episode because you had the first two episodes rated just a hair higher that's something you stand by yes sounds good Uh, these are all objective scores right there's no argument Uh, I don't know how you're gonna (laughs) they're objective other than they're different (laughs) between the two of us so (laughs) You know, uh, I will say before now, uh, beforehand, I didn't do nearly as good a job of you as separating out the first episode. They really do run together in my mind, which is good because they should as a two-part episode. But I keep yeah. thinking of it as just one episode. I think maybe I might have been a little harsher. I remember like, oh, this is 44 minutes of television, not 22 minutes of television. Maybe I would have been a little more harsh, but not much uh, because I really liked it. So like audiovisual, 8.5. Even even the first episode, for example, isn't as exciting, but there is a lot of great animation. You finally, you, I mean, you get to see he's interacting and talking with the dragon. There's lots of new areas and things that we you get to see a side of Iroh that you never have to see again, hopefully. But no, there, <laughs> and there's there is a lot of compelling sound effects and big musical, uh, big kind of musical set pieces and things like that happen. So really a big fan of the audio yeah. visual. Um, there again, the only doc might have just been because it is a longer episode and it's not just jam packed with it. Story eight point five. I love uh, everything from the beginning and end. I love that the introduction to the spirit world kind of gets its own episode because it is very big and impactful, and it's not the most exciting episode maybe by itself. But when you put it all together, it really does run together in my head as one big thing, like it's supposed to. Two parts certainly, but one one big experience. And if you pull these two episodes out and watch just them, you probably learn more about the whole series and the whole story, maybe than like any other couple of episodes that you could possibly pick. Like when you pull these out, there's so much to take away there. So it's very good. Uh, maybe not the most compelling sort of action or climax or anything, but very exciting. And then memorable action with a nine because this one sticks with me so much. Everything from like Sokka being kidnapped, that's, probably higher like we didn't even talk a lot about that here that's kind of high stakes like Sokka's gone they don't know if he's gonna come back alive or not so I mean Sokka's kidnapped you see you you see a dragon you see Avatar Roku and all of his power you see Iroh and Suko on a different kind of level and and sort of their combined power Iroh destroys a boulder with a chain which a small part of me is like all right that might be detrimental to my feelings of how cool Iroh should be. It's like, no, he destroyed a boulder with a chain. That's amazing. So just there's all these little pieces of this and that, and then just the culminating at the end with the destruction of the temple. I've only, I think this is my third time through the series, but as I was watching, it's like, you know, I didn't even need to watch it because I could still remember it so vividly from those first two times. So give it a nine there. That totaled out at a very hefty, Ooh, a, a very yeah. hefty eight point seven. <laughs> Now, part of that, I tend to be more generous with my memorability scores than you, and that score is weighted higher. So as I, I look at you do. as a as a <laughs> I look at the trends, like I said I'm more generous with them, and then I have more weight on them. Um, and so I think that's going to result as we go on a lot of my scores being higher than yours. 
except for I'm such a dork. I, I can't can't wait to do the analysis on <laughs> there <laughs> on all of this. I'm looking at the spreadsheet right now. You want to see? Nah, I don't want to show it on the screen, but I got. I'm looking at the spreadsheet nah, right yeah. now. I have a much uh, a much wider range than you. Like I'm more fast and loose with my ratings. Apparently, like yours 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 are all very precise. But I play it fast and loose. What can I say? But eight point seven, eight point two. That comes out eight point four. That's pretty respectable in the world of Avatar yeah. as we have so far. It is our highest combined episode, and because I, I think I'm just holding, I think I'm just holding my uh, my nines for episodes that I just. I know are are great. It's worth pointing that, out that are like. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was think I'm just knowing like the best the best of audio visual gets a ten, like, and I haven't seen that episode yet. I don't know when the episode's gonna come. I'm, I'm pretty sure this episode sometime along here that will get like a ten in audio visual. I so it's worth pointing other, out that you have, doled, you have doled out one nine, and that was on story. <laughs> I have doled out several more, but they've been in the memorable category, which to me, like that's <laughs> it. You're right; it doesn't take as much for something to be extremely memorable. Um, so I've doled out a few nines, and even the first episode, I put a ten on memorable because I could almost recite that episode <laughs> by heart. Um, but then on the on the converse side, like last week, I gave it a six because i weighed it so high that really like i mean that drags it <laughs> that drags it down and already yeah. like, i can't remember the kid's name the village doesn't have a name i don't like the episodes so it's like i still i still feel good about that so in the grand scheme of things my range is going to be much wider Rue. much much lower and oh yeah haru because he grows the mustache i remember <laughs> that part later not now so yeah my range is going to be much much wider my lows are going to be lower highs are going to be higher that happens but 8.4, I think, is very respectable rating. And uh, I think we can both agree that it's probably in our top two. Even if we had trouble picking maybe which one was our actual, I think we could say it's probably in our top two-ish, give or take. Two or three at this point. So, uh, in conclusion... Gosh, that's such a great scene. Yeah, it's very attractive. <laughs> and... and they play the great like melancholy music right now. Where they go like... Dum, 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 dum. I don't know. No, it's, it's like the it's the slow down music, the the step back melancholy yeah. music. That's a good way to describe it. But uh, forget melancholy. We should be excited because next week we yes. so next week we have. I don't know how much we spoil, but I think we can spoil a little bit. No, maybe. Well, let's yeah. About like how much? No, so, you advertise it a little bit. Well, I think we have to. Yeah. So we've got a bad episode to talk about because it's stupid and nobody likes it and so it just is whatever and then and is it confirmed then, that it is the episode coming up i think so gosh maybe i should check just to be safe look <laughs> what's up let me look let me look um how would i find if i was an episode list would i be in here oh no it ain't gonna have it whatever i'm pretty confident it's it um <laughs> it's a dumb episode and then so we're going to talk about it anyway because we're good, upstanding people. We're good to our word. Yes. But we're going to cut it short. Also, the uh, completionist in me has to have it filed in in the Excel sheet. From a data from a data standpoint, there's no way we can't yeah. at least give it the risk. So even if the show is garbage, like if we just like turn it on, we're like nine five six, and then we just turn it back off. Like at least we gave it the ratings. Uh, we gave it an attempt. But this, so then we're going to cut it off, and we're going to start another episode in which we are going to uh, do some Avatar ranking, and I'm very excited about that. That's yep. Uh, I've asked, asked the Facebook group their opinions. Um, they won't really factor into our rankings, honestly. Uh, but I like <laughs> to have them for reference. <laughs> and <laughs> hey, what do you guys think? Not that I care. Non-benders. Sockas. Yeah. You bunch of sockers, you don't get a say here. But you bunch of you bunch of non podcasters. <laughs> um, I don't even own a cheap microphone like I do. Yeah, like I spent five dollars on this. I will gather that data just for reference. You know, as we go through our rankings, say, oh well, you know, they're, you know, the fan club uh, had this avatar ranked here and here, and, and maybe also sprinkle in a couple comments here and there. 
um, just for just for reference. But yeah, we'll be ranking the avatars from worst to best, not best to worst. I don't know why people say that. Cause usually, people always count down. So from worst to best of the seven avatars that we actually know information about, which will include Wan, Yang Chin, Korok, Kiyoshi, Roku, Aang, and Korra. Is that your is that your uh, that's your order right there? So you just gave away your whole list. <laughs> How many possibilities? I wonder. Out of seven, like if you have seven things to fill seven slots, I don't know math well. Forty nine. Seven times seven. Is there only forty nine think... different? Yeah, because nothing. I don't exp- think that's nothing right. exponentiates and it's linear, so forty nine would make sense. So of the forty nine <laughs> possibilities, mine might be one of the seven most shocking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm assuming there's only one or two that can be shocking, so then that cuts it down from like all 49 to like, no, it has to be one of these scenarios here. Ah, oh, I'm so excited. Let's just do it now. No, let's do it next week. I'm pretty tired. It's like 11:30, but uh, it is 11:30. We started this two hours ago. We did, but it was two episodes, so you know, makes sense, right? Anyway, I, I guess it does. Uh, thanks a lot for calling over.